Hello, I want to welcome everyone to the third event of our new Think ND series, The Science and Business of Wine, Spirits and Beer. Today, we'll be discussing from grapes into wine, winemaking and winemakers. But first, we're excited to help build this Think ND community focused on wine and spirits and to remind you that we are launching a series of talks over the next year or so. Our series on the science and business of wine, spirits, and beer will include this series, which is Wine Behind the Curtain, as well as The Secret Life of Spirits. These two are already ongoing. And then in the spring, we will start The People's Brew, which is focused on the science and business of beer. We'll also have upcoming series titled Have Wine Glass, Will Travel, The Wines of the World, and The State of the Industry, Wine, Beer, and Spirits. Each of these themes will have a variety of talks where you'll hear from faculty here at Notre Dame, the Robert Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science at UC Davis, and from experts in each of these industries. We're excited to dive deep into these industries and to share with you the science, engineering, technology, business, and craftsmanship that goes into each glass. Um, at this time, I want to thank all of our collaborators on this series, and they include the Notre Dame College of Science, the Notre Dame Mendoza College of Business, the Robert Mondavi Institute for Food and Wine Science at UC Davis, the Notre Dame Family Wines, and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. In addition, thank you to our co-sponsors, the Notre Dame Senior Alumni and Young ND. Now, before we get started, we want to encourage you to ask questions. You can do this easily using the Google form that we are sharing with you now. Because there's a delay, it's best to submit your questions as soon as they come up. Please do not wait till the end. This will allow us to, excuse me, to facilitate the questions as effectively as possible. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can, given the time constraint. And I think you all uh, can see this Google form in your chat now. Um, and so now um, I'm, I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to dive into the topic of winemaking and the winemaker, how the winemaker's process affects the quality of, of wine. Um, I've, I've got to introduce uh, Dr. Ander Waterhouse, uh, alumni from uh, 1977. Um, and uh, today we're going to give you a basic uh, introduction to uh, the, uh, uh, the key winemaking decisions that impact wine quality. Thus far, we've covered the basics uh, with Wine 101 and what factors in the vineyard affect wine quality in our discussion on terroir. And we encourage you to catch up on or revisit these episodes on Think ND. So um, as I said, today we're gonna give you a basic introduction to key winemaking decisions that impact wine qualities. And then in the next three sessions of the series, you'll get a more in-depth discussion of marketing trends in the wine industry, the business side of running a family vineyard and distribution trends in the wine industry. And so now I'd like to welcome my colleague and friend, Professor Andy Waterhouse from the class of 1977, and also a professor and the faculty director of the Robert Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science at UC Davis. And he's with us today to help us cover the topic. Good morning, Holly. Um, and also joining us is our friend, uh, Chris Kajani, a Napa Valley native, winemaker and general manager of Bouchain, the oldest continuously operating winery in the Carneros region of the southern tip of Napa Valley. Welcome, Chris. Great to be here. Thank you. So as a foundation for the rest of our discussion, let's start out with the basics. So Andy, can you outline for us the basics of the winemaking process? Yeah, it's, uh, you start with grapes. Uh, that are harvested and you know, pick when you do that. That's an important decision. Generally, then you bring the, the grapes into the winery and you may do some cleanup, but then you, you, you crush and destem the grapes. Um, at that point, uh, you have what's called must. It's the grape solids and the grape and the liquid. And if you're making a white wine, you would then separate that and then ferment the white the, the white juice. If you're making a red wine, you keep it together. And the next step then is to do the actual fermentation, which relies on yeast. Um, most commonly in California, yeast is added, though not always. And then the, the fermentation will take anywhere from say five days to a couple of weeks, depending on the temperature. Reds are usually fermented warm and whites are usually fermented cool. At the end of the fermentation uh, with reds, you then have to press because you still have all the skins and seeds in there. And uh, you separate that out and then you have a fairly, well, it's not really clear at that point. It's a fairly turbid liquid, but it's mostly just liquid. 
And both fermentations, and usually once the fermentation is complete, you would let it sit for a while, um, maybe a few days, or if you're in a hurry, less. But anyway, you have to let the yeast sort of settle down. Um, and then you would put the wine into some container for aging. Uh, it might be a barrel or it might be another tank, depending on the flavor profile you're looking for. Then after an aging period, and this can be anywhere from a few months um, if you're in a hurry, or a few years if you're not. Uh, with whites, it's usually much less. It's, you usually turn whites around you know, within three to six months. With the reds, you might let them age for one year or even longer, a couple of years. Um, and then you usually do a few finishing steps. Uh, I'm not gonna go into those, but there's usually maybe might cold stabilize or do some fining, et cetera. And then you bottle the wine. And at that point, with inexpensive wines, usually they would be packed up and shipped maybe the same day. Um, there, so there'd be a short delay, maybe a few weeks um, before they actually show up on the shelf. Um, <clears throat> with some uh, producers, they would actually hold the, the bottles for an extended period, a few months or maybe even a year before, this, before it's sent off. Um, so the wine that you, you get on the shelf is generally six months from harvest at a minimum to a couple of years um, and sometimes even a bit longer. Okay, so that's the, the general picture. Perfect. Um, now that we have a basic outline, maybe we can start with a discussion of how the winemaker and the vineyard manager collaborate. So Chris, how do you as a winemaker get involved in how the vineyard is managed? You know, there's a saying in Napa Valley, um, and really across the globe that fine wine is made in the vineyard. And so the attention that you put into your vineyard and the time that you spend getting to know that site and the different characteristics of your property um, just allow you to make you know, a, a much higher quality product. Uh, I've been at Bouchain now since 2015, so eight harvests. When I got here in April of 2015, the first thing that we did was meet with the vineyard management company that we work with. And I had been working with them for nine years already at another um, winery, but meet with them, go over different, um, different passes that would be required in the vineyard, different timing of those passes, which is really critical. Um, these little details change year to year based on what mother nature throws at you. Is it a wet year, a dry year? Is it a cold year, a, a warm year? You know, was there hail during bloom, et cetera, et cetera. So spending a lot of time um, putting those protocols together and, and getting to know the site uh, was very critical for me. Um, I've also found that the more time you spend in the vineyard, the less surprises you have coming into harvest. <laughs> and one of the most important decisions you can make, if not the most important decision you can make is when to harvest. When do you pick that block? Do you pick that block? Um, you know, all together on this date? Do you pick it all together next week? Do you split it? Are you gonna maybe pick some early and some late? Uh, is there a corner of the block perhaps that holds water or, um, you know, has, ha has more impact um, from drought conditions? And if so, do you cut that off and not put that fruit with the rest of the block? So all those little decisions become really critical and those details make a huge difference as you come into the winery and actually start making wine from those grapes. So yeah. you, oh, go ahead. Holly, I just want to mention, I remember uh, hearing from a winemaker actually from France who has a property in Napa. His name is Christian Moex. He has a property called Dominus that's quite well known. And he gave a talk to our students some years ago. And he said, well, we've been here now for, I think at the time was 20 years. And he said, we're just, we're really just beginning to understand our site. Yes. Yeah, so it, as Chris says, it takes a while to learn that your vineyard and, and how it develops. So, so Chris, you had when, mentioned some decisions such as, as when to harvest um, and how do you decide when to do that? What factors go into that? And are, are there some other decisions you need to make like such as irrigation, et cetera? So deciding when to harvest, there's multiple factors. Uh, there's not a winemaker I know that doesn't have like six weather apps on their phone. So it's this constant, constant review of the weather. What is coming? When is it coming? How hot is it gonna be? How cold is it gonna be? Is it gonna rain? How much is it gonna rain? Um, 
So looking at, at what mother nature is doing is critical there, especially for me making Pinot Noir, there are certain clones of Pinot Noir that hang out absolutely fine through, through a bit of a heat spike. And there's other clones that will just collapse. And um, you've really missed your shot at doing something fantastic if, if you wait too long. So watching the weather, number one. Um, number two, you know, depending on where you are, you may or may not have water availability at the end of the season. We're fortunate that we do, um, but we tend to dry farm most years. Uh, we're on clay here in Carneros and clay has fantastic water holding capacity. Um, most of our vines also were planted anywhere from 1984 for the older vines, a um, lot of vines in 96. And then we do have some new plantings that were planted in 17, uh, which are not quite as drought tolerant as some of the other parts of the vineyard. So keeping all of that in mind, um, but one thing that we definitely saw um, in some of these drought vintages is um, shorter canopies, less green growth on your canopy. And there's a couple things that happen with that. If you have less leaf area, you're not able to ripen as much fruit. If you have less leaf area, you're also more prone to sunburn and sun damage um, because there's just not enough leaf area to really shade the, the, the clusters appropriately. And so there's all these different items that come into play on when you're gonna harvest. And then there's some nuts and bolts decisions that you make. Um, you may be 100% full in the winery. You may not have a tank free. <laughs> so occasionally it's like, okay, what are we gonna press so that we can bring that in? Because we know we have to bring that in. So what, what are, what's maybe gonna come out of tank a little earlier um, so that you can make that happen? And so it, it's a lot of decisions like that as you, as you get into the thick of it. Perfect. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Andy? Um, I, I think it, it's clear that uh, when Chris said, you know, great wine is made in the vineyard, that the wine, you think the winemaker is making the wine and, you know, getting the grapes, but really the winemaker's job is almost 50% outside the winery. Yeah. Okay, so let's imagine now that you've got a bountiful harvest of beautifully ripened grapes that has arrived in your vineyard doors. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the process is from there? You know, for example, so, how much effort you put into sorting the grapes or, or anything like that? Yeah, I like to say there's, there's a thousand ways to make wine. There's a thousand wineries in Napa Valley now. Um, and there's no one way to do this. So what we have decided to do is we tend to night harvest everything. And so at six o'clock in the morning when the crew is here, that fruit is on the crush pad, whether it's 10 tons or 20 tons. Um, we have 87 planted acres. Um, depending on the vintage, that'll bring in 220 to 300 tons of fruit every year. Um, and so thinking about how that's coming in is important and the flow of fruit coming into the winery. So having it on the crush pad at six in the morning, um, if there's an issue, if something breaks down um, or if someone's sick or you know, X, Y, or Z, you have a little bit of flexibility in your day to get things done. And so that works really well for us for, for practical purposes. We also tend to cold soak all of our Pinot Noir. And if it comes in at 75 degrees, you cannot cold soak it. If it comes in at 55 degrees, that is perfection. So thinking about energy use and, and working smarter, not harder. So if fruit comes in cold, it's easier to, to cold soak and get that going. So basically um, when, if I'm talking about Pinot Noir, when Pinot Noir comes in, um, it does go across the sorting table. Um, we have the ability to both cluster sort um, and go into more detail if we wanted to and berry sort. Most of the time with Pinot Noir, we're just doing strict cluster sorting. And honestly, most of that happens in the vineyard. So in the vineyard itself, if we're concerned with the, the fruit quality, we'll just do a pass the day before we pick and drop anything that we feel um, wouldn't go into the fermenter. Most of the time when you're sorting, once the fruit is in and you're trying to get it in a tank, you're sorting out leaves, you're sorting out random pieces of whatever ends up in there. We call it MOG, material other than grapes. Um, every once in a while you see like a picking knife, which you definitely don't want going through your stemmer because that's gonna send it south. Um, and so we do spend some time sorting. It goes through a, a gentle, prolonged stemmer. There's a million different types of stemmers. 
Um, and then we tend to, to, to stem into basically the half ton bins that we pick into also. And then that half ton bin carries this distemmed fruit and it just gets dumped over the top of an open top tank. Uh, and that starts the whole process. Then for reds, we basically um, are fermenting with native yeast. Um, this particular facility was built in the, the uh, early 60s. And so there's a lot of yeast floating around in here. So while we're starting native, we're probably finishing with whatever our house strain is. Um, the Pinot Noir will basically sit in cold soak sometime between six to, to seven, eight days. Um, it, it will naturally heat up or sometimes we give it a little push with warm glycol and let that fermentation um, take over. And then what I feel like one of my primary, primary jobs is, um, is basically tasting tanks. And so there's about 50 tanks in this winery. And I keep pointing this way because they're all right there. Um, and we taste tanks every day, uh, sometimes twice a day, most of the time once a day in the morning and make some decisions on um, the progression of that wine and tank. Sometimes for certain wines, you feel like it needs a little more stuffing. And at that point you can heat it up, you can punch it down a little bit more, you can, um, you can pump it over, you can delastage, where basically you're pulling out the juice from the tank and then blasting it back in on the skins. There's a million ways to, to um, sort of like craft a certain um, feel of the wine. And so tasting tanks every day allows us to make those, those kind of uh, important, but um, you know, small step decisions along the way. And then you have to decide when to press it. So you're going through and you're tasting. Most of our fermentations are done um, from, from tank to press in approximately you know, 14 to 20-ish days. Um, and so continuing to taste and, and get a feel for if that wine should sit on the skins a little bit longer, um, if it needs to come off immediately because the tannin is starting to feel a bit sharper. Um, so those are all the, the kind of day-to-day -day decisions. Um, and then for white wine, uh, we don't distem our whites, they go direct to press. And so um, it's like a whole cluster press. So the cluster that you see on the vine gets snipped off, gets put in a bin, that bin gets dumped in a press, and then out, out comes the juice in the press pan. And that'll get chilled overnight and drop, drop a little bit of solids. And then you're basically whacking off the solids for Chardonnay into barrel because we're barrel fermenting most of that. But for a lot of the aromatic whites, um, like this Gewürztraminer, uh, it'll go into an egg or an amphora or a small stainless steel tank. Um, and again, you're watching that fermentation every day, but at a much cooler temperature. Our Pinot Noir, we tend to ferment around 77, maybe 80 degrees, but the whites will be 56, sometimes 58, if we're trying to push it through the end of fermentation and get it dry. That little heat sometimes will push through. So all these little decisions on a daily basis with 50 wines in house um, is basically how I, how I start my day. <laughs> so <clears throat> just a comment there, um, you might think, oh, that sounds like fun, but actually coming in at six or seven or eight in the morning, I don't know when Chris actually does this, but you know, and then trying to taste 50 wines and make critical decisions, by the way, um, you're spitting. You actually don't swallow any of that. Uh, you try not to, because if you did, you wouldn't be able to make the decisions. <laughs> that um, is a hundred percent accurate. Um, it is work. It is not a fun tasting. It is a lot of work and you have to be sharp. I mean, you have, and, and it's difficult. I, I mean, when I taste wine, after I get through 10 reds or so, my mouth is kind of stripped and I don't, I can't tell what's the, you know, what the taste of the next one is. So this really is takes skill and experience to do this properly. I will say this though, um, coming in and tasting through the tanks um, is something that I really enjoy. Even before coffee, we're normally here at six in the morning tasting tanks. <laughs> I normally get a shot of espresso in, but we'll taste through the tanks. Uh, then we do another shot of espresso and then we end up out in the vineyard tasting grape samples. And grape samples are different because the acids are much higher and it feels like the enamel is coming off on your teeth. Um, that tasting of a thousand super acidic grapes 
um, at whatever, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning to decide when you're picking and, and to pull samples um, for, for additional chemistry. That to me is the harder part. I really enjoy it. And I enjoy the, the outside work and I enjoy following the vineyard blocks. But if there's something that's painful, it's definitely acidic grapes. And I really don't know how people do this with sparkling wine, because when you taste grapes with TAs over 10, 11, um, you feel like your mouth is in a bar fight. I mean, it is so, so acidic. So a technical bit there, TA is titratable acidity for all of those out in the audience who, who aren't familiar with that. Um, yeah, totally. Oh, total acidity, excuse me. Um, I was going to maybe wonder if we could dig down into a, a couple of the more technical points that you mentioned. So you stress temperature at several points. How does temperature affect the quality of the wine that comes out? So there is a, a direct correlation between um, temperature and tannin. And so tannin lives in the skin of grapes. And, and Andy can, can jump in here um, and, and tell us a little more about that. But as I'm trying to, to taste wines and, and decide um, on the structure of the wine and, and when it may be overstructured and we need to get it off the skins, um, temperature plays a big role. Uh, you extract additional tannin at these higher temperatures. And when I started here at Boucher, they were fermenting at much higher temperatures and the wines held a lot of tannin. And so it was something that I felt we could craft in a way that was a little more elegant. And so we took that temperature down immediately. The other thing with fermentation to keep in mind is you can always take the temperature up. If I'm at 77 degrees and I feel like the wine's a little weak and it, it needs some stuffing, I mean, I can heat it to 80, 82, 85, 90 if I wanted, um, but I can't take it down. Once it's in the middle of fermentation and it's going, you, you have a really hard time cooling that ferment fermentation down outside of just dispersing some temperature with a, a pump over or, or a punch down. And so it's something that we watch really carefully. And it's a really easy way to kind of tweak the, the body of a wine. Do you want to add to that, Andy? Yeah, I mean, temperature is possibly the most, um, the, the biggest lever that winemakers have to alter the, the flavor of the wine during the fermentation process. Um, we did an experiment some years ago with a couple different companies looking at fermentation temperature as part of an, the experiment. And the results were dramatic. Um, and actually, as a consequence of that, one of the winemakers involved in the experiment was so impressed that he altered the temperature of his fermentations going forward. So it, it really has a large impact. And I think um, our audience should realize that Chris sort of alluded to this, that, that fermentations generate heat. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> um, if you like, if, if they get warm, they get, they get fermenting faster and generating more heat per unit time. And that's why it's so hard to cool it down once they really get going. Another technical thing I wanted to follow up on, as you mentioned, um, sometimes destimming and other times not destimming. What impact does that decision have on the wine? So I have never um, been at a place where I had to destem whites. In the grand scheme of things, I've, I've had the ability to come in whole cluster uh, and very, very gently press those grapes um, to receive white juice to then ferment. Um, but some places are processing, you know, 50, 100 tons of whites you know, in a morning. And at, in that case, trying to get whole cluster in, um, these whole cluster press cycles, these slow champagne press cycles for whole cluster can be like, you know, two, three hours sometimes, especially by the time you load the press, you press it, you unload the press. Um, you know, it, it's a pretty extensive time frame. And so if you're trying to process, you know, 100 tons of Chardonnay, you're probably not going to go whole cluster. You're going to go ahead and destem it. You can get, you know, 50% more fruit or more into your press at that point, you will have um, a slightly different characteristic of the wine because you, in the process of destemming, um, are occasionally, um, you know, going to, to crush those skins. And the skins is where this tannin that we've been discussing lives. And even in white grapes, there's, there's tannins and, and there's this phenolic character from tannins that you get. And so sometimes uh, for these destemmed wines, 
you might then um, be finding out some of that additional phenolic character. Um, it's not something that I've had to do, um, but it's certainly something that, that gets done um, as you're processing more and more fruit. And then, yeah, so, so, go ahead. Yeah, yeah so pressing, <clears throat> pressing whites without destemming is takes both more time, as Chris mentioned, because you're having to deal with all the stems in the press, but also it, you get lower yield, like you get less juice out. So for people who are like trying to you know maximize output, they would never do that. Um, and, and basically you get a finer quality wine out when you uh, do whole cluster pressing. Um, now on the flip side <clears throat> for reds, I don't know, I don't think Chris didn't really mention this, but some Pinot Noir winemakers actually ferment the reds with some stems or all the stems in there. And, and that has a dramatic impact on the flavor profile of the wine. Um, I don't know if Chris wants to go into that, but so there's, we, when you talk about stems, you, you can talk about the stem issue in pressing whites and then the stem issue in fermenting reds. Yeah, we use whole cluster and Pinot Noir um, depending on the year, depending on the block. Um, Definitely. In years that are really cold, um, the, the peduncle, which is what truly connects the, the wine or the grape cluster to the shoot, um, in really cold years, sometimes that doesn't lignify as well. And so it, it could be um, kind of partially brown. It could be neon green in really cold years. And my preference is not to put neon green stems into a fermentation. Um, I know people do, and I know they do it really successfully. It's just not something that I am comfortable with. And so we look for, for really nice lignification, um, and something kind of brown and hardened off when we do use whole cluster. Um, it tends to add like a really nice spice component. It adds another layer of, of tannin phenolic character to the wine. Um, it can just be absolutely beautiful. And, and strangely, while you're adding like this sort of like woody component. Uh, it can also add, add this really fun floral note um, that we like, but it, you know, again, it depends on mother nature. It depends on the block. It depends on ripening. And so we move it around year to year um, depending on, on what it looks like. Terrific. Um, now that we've, uh, I guess there was one other thing that you mentioned, which was different types of tanks. So um, you mentioned using amphora. And so what types of influences do those tanks have on the outcome of the wine? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Holly. Um, we have some blocks, you know, that are a few acres um, or two and a half acres. They're big enough that you can split the block. And so we've split between, let's call it a four or five ton open top and a four or five ton closed top. Um, we have some wines that, that'll end up in these um, larger fudras, these big oak rounds. Uh, we have wines, there's some eggs over here. We have uh, uh, wines and egg, wines and amphora. And so whatever you put the wine in, that wine will take on some characteristic unless what you're putting it in, um, uh, for aging purposes, for sure is, is completely neutral when you're fermenting. Uh, even if you're fermenting in, um, in, in like neutral Oak for Chardonnay, um, versus stainless steel, those two different, um, vessels will give you different characteristics. Part of it's the, the sort of, um, volume of the vessel. So a barrel's around 60 gallons. You normally, when you're fermenting, you're putting in 45 or 50 gallons of juice because due to the ferment, it's all going to bubble out the top if you overfill it. But when you think about that, there's quite a bit of um, lees contact and the, the small particulates that tend to drop to the bottom and settle in the fermentation process. Those are all through the wine. And so the lees contact of that juice in a 60 gallon barrel is much higher than it would be in whatever, a thousand gallon um, stainless steel tank. Um, and if you fermented it in something like this, especially if, if the, the large cask was new, then you have a lot of oak on, impact on it. And so these decisions um, 
um, are really interesting for winemakers, especially if, if you have new vessels. We had never worked with Amphora before um, the 2022 vintage. And so to taste um, like some of the aromatic whites like the Gewürztraminer out of Amphora and Riesling has been really fun because we had only fermented them in stainless steel before. Um, so those decisions are, are, are some of the key, um, you know, some of the key focus points uh, for me as we start going through the um, harvest is trying to decide like what are we trying to craft what are we trying to show what do we like about how we've been doing it what do we possibly want to change what new vessels do we have we could use and so that all comes into play when you're when you're deciding what wines you're going to make okay so wonderful now you've got some newly fermented wine um and i'm about to ask what the next steps are so aging and all of that but first what does this newly fermented wine taste like is this something we'd like to drink <laughs> another great question um yes and no uh we were having our team come through um as we had finished some of the white wines that, that were an egg and that were in for in amphora um and some wines that we had finished um in smaller oak and then put up to, to large cask. Um, and we were doing that, I guess we started in November um, with the aromatic whites and they tasted amazing. Um, they were they were so floral and, and such primary fruit. They were really, really pretty. Um, the, the charm of a young wine, some of the charm of a young wine um, can be crushed um, by the fact that it hasn't gone through uh, malolactic fermentation. For the whites, a lot of our whites don't go through this, this secondary fermentation that softens um, uh, malic, uh, uh, sorry, is, is softening this, this malic acid um, into lactic acid. You don't have to go through the secondary fermentation. Um, and for a lot of our white wines, we don't, or we only go through partially. Um, and they can be absolutely lovely when they're very, very young even though we're not gonna bottle anything until um, sometime March, April. However, with red wine, if it has not gone through malolactic, it can be um, you know, very, very sharp. Malic acid, um, for those of you that have made an apple pie, it's like when you take the, the um, Granny Smith apples, those green apples, if you peeled 10 of those and shoved all those peels in your mouth, that's malic acid. It's really tart um, and, and kind of sweet, tarty, sour, patchy. It's not super pleasant. And in a white wine, some of that can be delicious, you know, and, and add a really nice zing. Andy and I were talking about um, likening uh, acidity in wine to, to like squeezing lemon on something when you're cooking. It adds that nice zing, it adds a brightness. In red wine, however, most red wines, you, you go through the secondary fermentation, you're polishing that acid by going through um, malolactic, softening the malic acid to lactic acid, and it, it um, adds this more delightful um, kind of creamy, um, texture to the, to the acid versus it being so sour patchy. So some of the young red wines, um, we're still tasting them, but like, it's not something we show to the public. It's like, just wait till it's done. You don't really want to try it right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do want to, I mean, with the red wines also, there's, uh, the tannins are usually very high in a new wine, not very pleasant to drink. I remember when I first came to Davis, I was asked to participate in a bunch of these tastings that were like in January, February of the recent vintage. And it was, it was punishing. Um, the other thing that in, in brand new wines, um, there's an, usually an intense fruitiness that comes from the fermentation process. The yeast actually make these very potent uh, fruit, fruit flavor esters. And, um, you know, most people aren't aware of this. I mean, they, they don't know that wine tastes really different right after fermentation than, than what you experience when you buy a bottle of wine. The closest you can get actually is to try Beaujolais Nouveau, which is sold and, and bottled a, 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 on the shelf in November. So it's usually about two months out from fermentation. And you can get an experience what that, what many new red wines taste like. Um, and actually, for me, well, I'm not a winemaker, uh, trying to sort out this, you know, how is this wine going to taste, let's say, six months out, isn't something I can predict 
You know, that takes experience like Chris has to be able to taste those wines when they're young and actually understand, okay, this is how they're going to evolve. I mean, it takes a lot of experience to, to be able to do that. Terrific. So now that we're talking about the evolution and maturation, um, so what are those next steps in the in the maturation of the wine? You mentioned secondary fermentation, and one thing that might be interesting for people to know here is that that's a bacterial fermentation. A lot of times people get kind of wigged out by bacteria, but these are where bacteria are our friends, just like in making yogurt or anything like that. Um, but yes, please please tell us a little bit more about the the, the next steps. Yeah, so outside of deciding, um, especially for whites, if you're going to put it through malolactic, and, and if you choose to do that natively, if you choose to inoculate it, um, if you want to stop it halfway through, um, how you're going to follow that. So the, those are some of the protocols you put together. Um, for our red wines, they all go through. Um, and then again, you're following them because when they're done uh, and assuming that you want to complete malolactic fermentation, when it's done, that's the first time that you can really sulfur the wine and protect it. And so uh, those become very key decisions. We're pulling samples all the time um, and making sure that we're following these wines as they are um, wrapping up uh, the, the malolactic fermentation and then getting sulfur in them to, to protect them. The sulfur itself um, is a, an antioxidative um, addition and it keeps the wine from browning. It keeps the wine from getting aldehydic, um, which is such a funny term that you really don't hear much outside of the wine industry. But if anybody's had Calvados, or if you can imagine like what a bruised apple sort of smells like, like that's, that, those are aldehydes. Um, and so it's something that, that uh, sulfur will protect your wine from in addition to any, any oxidative character. And as all of this is happening, you've also decided what to put the wine in, right? So we talked about eggs, amphora, um, you know, keep it in stainless, put it in barrel. And then the choices are what barrels, you know, here we have 10, 11 coopers that we work with. We have all different kinds of, um, of toast on the staves for those barrels. Um, you think about when you're going to bottle the wine. So this is kind of a strange, um, scenario, but if you buy uh, barrels that have medium, uh, like a medium toast on them, it tends to take longer for that toast to really come out into the wine. And so those are really built for wines that, that are going to um, what we call over harvest. So those are built for wines that if we brought the fruit in in 22 and we made that vintage in 22, these wines won't bottle until not just 23, but after harvest in 23 maybe December, or maybe even an early 24, 18 months after harvest. Um, it takes a, a, a little bit longer for the, the oak in these, these medium toasted barrels to, to have this, this smoother impact that you're looking for. Um, the medium plus toast, on the other hand, has a higher toast level. You would think that you would just leave it in there longer. Um, but for the wines that we're making here, uh, we use that medium plus toast that's slightly heavier, um, toast for the wines that we're going to end up bottling in, in August ish. So they have around 11 months in Oak. Um, and we find that's a real, that's a real sweet spot for these wines. You have a lot of uh, brown spice that comes out and baking spice that comes out, um, versus at 10 months or so for the medium toast, it can be to me, um, a little planky. It tastes like a, a little more of a raw wood character where if you left the wine in, you know, for, for 16 months or 18 months, it would certainly soften and be lovely, but that's not what our bottling schedule is. And so you, you're, you're thinking of all these things as you're putting um, barrel orders together and deciding which wine goes into what barrel. You can see it's not simple, Holly. <laughs> uh, definitely. So how do you know when it's done? I mean, you, you kind of alluded to that, but, um, you know, if you had, uh, if you weren't having to fight with uh, figuring out how to, um, you know, move wine out so you can move wine in, et cetera, when would you know that, no, this wine is really as done as I want it to be? Let me, let me jump in here. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that, um, you know, I, I'm a chemist and I like to analyze all kinds of things. And for instance, if I was going to try to characterize these wines, I could use, say, a a gas chromatograph, uh, GCMS, or maybe an LC, a liquid chromatograph, 
but none of that is useful in making these decisions, believe me. I mean, it's good for research, but if you're gonna make a, a, a decision of when to, when to take the wine out of barrel, you don't use a machine. Yeah, a lot of it's tasting like we talked about. Um, so we have our own bottling line. We can bottle whenever we want. So we could bottle after harvest if we wanted to. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, um, there's, there's a, a freshness to Pinot Noir and to our particular site that I really like to capture in August. I feel like it gets tamped down when we hold it over harvest. Um, and so in the grand scheme of things, we've set our, our bottling up that way. But I will say this, um, you know, we, we trial barrel coopers, we look, um, you know, and continue to investigate, you know, different types of barrels, et cetera, um, and different, different sorts of, of vessels with the amphora um, and eggs and, and whatnot. And there are times that let's say you have 20 barrels in this one block and it's a block that you want to bottle on its own. Maybe it's a certain clone of Pinot Noir, a certain part of the vineyard. And there are definitely barrels sometimes where you go through and you're like, nope, I don't like that one. <laughs> um, it, it, it could either be that the oak didn't integrate well with the wine, it was too impactful, or it just tastes like nothing, or, or back to what I was mentioning before, it's a little planky, a little raw. But here's the really strange thing with winemaking. The really strange thing is that sometimes two plus two is seven. And so if you kick out barrels that you don't like individually, the whole thing falls apart. Like that barrel that, that individually is not your favorite is doing something in this blend that like brings that blend alive. And so I, we taste everything fully blind when we decide to, to do a final, final blend. And so we'll go through the, the choices blind um, after we've gone through the barrels individually. And I think that that allows us to, to have some muscle memory of, of what this blend has been like before, what we're trying to showcase from the vintage, what is really expressing itself in a way that you want to put in a bottle and showcase. And it, it tends to tamp down your bias of like, oh, I didn't like that barrel. So, oh, I like this blend better that doesn't have the barrel in it. Half the time you taste it blind and what you thought you were going to like is completely different. That's a lot of fun. It kind of reminds me of like fish sauce, right? If you taste fish sauce by itself, you never would want to have anything to do with it, but it is what absolutely makes that Thai food, right? Yes. So instead of yes, something yeah, yeah. that is too much is, is what you need. Um, okay, so now we've got a well-aged wine that's close to being bottled. And so maybe we, we've got a few minutes left. Tell us a little bit about um, the bottling process. You know, how, you, uh, how do you decide, for example, between natural corks and technical corks? And are there any other considerations? So we've moved some of our production into technical cork. Um, some wines, you, you're, you're not really looking for any oxygen exchange and you're, you're truly trying to protect it from all oxygen. So when we're getting ready to bottle, these wines um, will have, you know, argon blasted through uh, hoses as they're being racked. They're going to have argon blasted all through the bottling line, you know, as you're trying to get wine into the filler bowl um, and get it in the bottle. And at that point, some of those... Um, from up for us anyway, some of those aromatic white wines um, are fantastic in technical cork. Technical corks also come a long way and there's a lot more research behind the different levels of cork and how much oxygen ingress they allow. And so for a wine that you wanted to age 10 years, you might use a, a, a tighter cork um, because it's going to be there for so long. For wine that you're going to release within a year, you may use like a looser technical cork that allows some oxygen ingress because you know you're going to drink it quickly. You know it's going to be sold out and you want a little bit, you don't want the wine too tight. You want it to have a little bit of air so it's a little looser and a little more um, aromatically um, present. Uh, so those are all decisions that we look at. Um, traditionally through my career, I always used cork uh, and I love cork and we spend a lot of time on cork trials and we spend a lot of time choosing cork. Um, but one of the main issues that you still see is you have TCA, the trichloroanisole um, and this cork taint, um, which is kind of like a, an aroma of, of whatever moldy cardboard or, or something just pretty moldy. And Wet it dog. really affects 
<laughs> yeah, the wet dog, the moldy cardboard, and it's it's so unpleasant in a wine. And many consumers will try that and just think your wine is horrible. They don't necessarily recognize that it's a cork problem. Um, and the, the worst thing for me is not when a wine is super corked where you can really taste it, but when it's just starting to, to become corked and it just tamps the wine down and it makes it so dull and so quiet that you just don't get anything out of it. Um, there are all those levels of frustration. So, uh, so for some wines, we've switched over to the, the technical cork. So Andy, did you want to add something or uh, look like? I, I'll just, I'll mention a few things. Um, I mean, the, I mean, Bouchain's not using these, but many companies have started using screw caps for certain mm -hmm. wines, particularly whites that they expect to be open quickly. Um, and frankly, the screw caps can work nearly as well as corks uh, in many situations. The only situation where you really need a natural cork is for very long aging. And that's because the cork actually changes its character over time. It actually lets in less oxygen over time. Um, and, and the synthetics don't really change their behavior very much. Now we don't have data on these technical corks. They might do that. Um, but if you're getting a wine to drink tomorrow, it really doesn't matter what the closure is. Okay, terrific. Um, we've got a few minutes left, but before we go to the last couple of questions I wanted to ask, I want to remind uh, the audience to please post questions because there's this delay. Um, and so I think the, the um, question posting form was just reposted. So uh, please do ask questions. So now that we've got the big picture, um, what is the hardest part of making wine? <laughs> um, I would say the biggest challenge year to year is mother nature. Um, and going back to what Andy said about um, Dominus, like finally after 20 years, feeling like they have a handle on their vineyard and, and have some understanding, so much of that has to do with mother nature. Because if you've seen, you know, one wet vintage in 10 years, you don't really know like what the different parts of your vineyard are going to do. You, you've got one year, um, but basically in California, you know, you get a real, uh, you know, onslaught of rain every you know eight to ten years or so the last really wet vintages were 17 and 18 where our average rainfall is about 22 inches here in carneros and it rained you know over 40 45 inches both years but we haven't seen one like that since and we're kind of like waiting to see how this year plays out um, if we have some late rains or not so in the course of you know 10 years you could see eight dry and two wet or nine nine dry and one wet um, and so mother nature is one of your biggest challenges and time, like just the time to get to know the vineyard, seeing what mother nature does year to year, seeing how different blocks and different parts of the vineyard react, um, and time with new plantings. Um, when I came on, one of the first things we did was, was kind of triage this 87 acres we had planted. And we had a lot that was planted back in 84 that was not, um, not a, really in its prime anymore. And so deciding what you're going to replant you know, how you're going to do it, what, what, you know, uh, rootstock, what budwood you're going to use, how you're going to set it up, um, all the chemistry of the soil and the soil pits and figuring that out. And so all of that's very important. And then outside of what you can't control with mother nature, some of the biggest challenges, um, in winemaking are equipment failure. So you don't use these things 12 months out of the year. You know, the distemmer for us is used for like 30 days every year and that's it. And then you put it away and you do preventative maintenance on it and you, you know, oil things up, but, but it's not something you use all the time. And so every year something breaks, you know, your chiller goes down or your distemmer is acting wonky or your press is acting wonky or pumps, um, you know, whatever it is, punch down devices. Uh, these things are used once a year outside of the pumps. And so uh, one thing I did want to highlight is, is I feel like the beauty of winemaking is really the community. So we've had friends call us with broken press, you know, with a broken press, like with a crush pad full of fruit, and they've brought, they've brought grapes over and we've pressed it for them. We've had equipment or things go down where we have to take it to a, you know, you call a friend and you take it to a neighbor. 
Um, the community of winemaking uh, here in Napa Valley is really strong. Um, and you can, we all know each other, um, especially Pinot people. We, we definitely are pretty tight and hang out quite a bit. And so you call your neighbors, you call your friends. Um, the community is here to, to really lend support and, and make sure that, uh, you know, that we're taking care of each other. And, and that's something I really, really enjoy about, about this career and about this area. I'm, I've seen this in action too, Holly. I mean, it, it really is, it is a very real uh, thing going on that, that people really do help each other out. Mm. And I would like to make a little pitch here for UC Davis. I mean, we do encourage our students to get to know each other. And I know Chris is still friends, good friends with some of the, of the classmates she had from, you know, uh, I won't say how many years back, but um, you know, so it, it is a it is a community effort uh, for winemaking in California, and uh, we're very proud of that. And I, I, I really I think it makes winemaking as a career a very enjoyable one because you do have a very strong community around you, and that's that's the case throughout most of California. For those of you who are interested in maybe a second career, it it, it is a very rewarding career for a number of reasons. So, so given this, uh, Chris, could you tell us a little bit how you got into this career? Since it's my understanding, you started out with a background a little bit more like mine. I did, Holly. Um, I uh, have been to Davis twice. So the first time I went um, as an undergrad, I was focused on uh, biological sciences um, and really focused on biochemistry. Uh, and to be honest, Andy, I said I would never go back. I was like, oh, Davis, like such a cow town. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, hey. and, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting to the good part. I'm getting to the good part. Um, so anyway, I ended up working at, at, uh, Genentech and, and I was looking at grad schools to continue to kind of move my career forward. And at the time I was doing